Hey, today we're talking about experiments. I can hear the excitement. Oh yeah, you've been waiting for this all semester. So if you wanted to do a basic experiment, first of all, you might be wondering, why would I want to do a basic experiment? Hmm. That's a good question. Well, what we've been doing so far is just a standard research study. We've been looking to see if there's a relationship between two variables. If you remember, correlation does not imply causation. So just because we say that one thing is related to something else doesn't mean that that one thing caused that other thing. There could be a third variable, there could be an issue with directionality, right? What we assume is the independent variable could actually be the dependent variable. So we don't actually know if there's causation unless we're doing an experiment. So there are three things that you need for a basic experiment. One, you need to control the independent variable which basically means whatever thing is your independent variable, you can't just let the participants in your study choose whether they get the drug or don't get the drug, whether they get one treatment or versus another treatment. You have to be the one in control. If you're not in control, then it's only correlational. It's when you have control of that independent variable that you can do a basic experiment. The other thing is you want the groups that you're comparing to be equivalent. So if your groups are equivalent, then you know that any differences between the two groups are because of your control of the independent variable. And then finally, at the end of the study, you need to measure the dependent variable. By measuring the dependent variable, we can see if the independent variable caused a change in the dependent variable. You're probably wondering, and you're also probably wondering why I always say you're probably wondering. It's the only way I know how to segue, so I'm going to be better about that. The other thing that you're probably wondering is, how do I make my groups equivalent, right? Well, that's a great question that you were definitely wondering. One thing that you can do is what's called a random assignment. Usually, when you have a group of people, they are different, right? Some people might be male or female or non-binary. There might be people of different ethnicities and religions, of heights and weights and uh, athletic ability, intelligence, academic uh, achievement, right? All these people are different. And if you let them self-select, you might find that the groups are biased in some way. Maybe one group has more tall people or another group has more people who are atheist or one group has people who are more uh, anxious, right? What you want to do is give everybody in your study an equal chance of being in every group. This way, the little differences between everybody get averaged out. So you're likely to get people who are tall and short and average height and Christian and Buddhist and atheist and anxious and whatever the opposite of anxious is in each side. So you have equal and comparable groups. The simplest form of random assignment would just be a coin flip or the roll of a die, right? You say that you have two groups, you flip a coin, if it lands on heads, they go in group A, if it lands on tails, they go in group B, right? If there are six groups, you can roll a six-sided die. If there are three groups, I don't know what you would do. Maybe you just tape two coins together like a T, I don't know. Anyway, that would be a random assignment, just ensuring that both uh, or that everybody in your study has a chance of being in either group.
Now, you're probably wondering if I was going to start off with saying you're probably wondering, and I did. So if you have a betting pool, you probably won some money. Congratulations. It's tough times out there, so I'm glad that you were able to make a dime off of my weakness. Speaking of dimes, let's talk about the post-test only design dime. Nope, didn't work. Uh, so the post-test only design is the most basic of basic experiments, right? You do all the things that you want to do. You take your groups and you divide them into two. So you have a control group and an experimental group. The control group is the group that doesn't get the treatment and the experimental group is the one that does get the treatment. So if I were to be testing a drug, right, I would give some people the drug, some people would not get the drug, and then I would have two different groups. And I'm comparing the people who got the drug to the people who didn't get the drug, right? Simple as that. So I split them into two groups while my phone rings. And I give one group the intervention, the treatment, the drug, right? And then I measure them and compare them at the end. That is why it's called a post-test only design, because you only measure them at the end, after you've given the intervention. Now, how did I get people into these two groups? I used random assignment. Random assignment ensures that my groups were equal to begin with. But you have a question, I can tell. I can see it burning in your eyes. You're also wondering, how can you see me? Well, that's a story for another time. Uh, so the uh, thing that you might be wondering is, how do I know that these groups are equal? Well, you don't, right? You haven't measured them here. You don't know what they were before you gave one group the treatment. So what you could do if you were really concerned with how they were at the beginning of the study and how they might have changed uh, from the beginning of the study to the end of the study, you might want to go to the next slide. Now, the pretest post-test design is probably what you're wondering about. So as you're wondering about that, I'm going to explain it. You do the same thing, randomly assign into two groups. But now, before you give the experimental group the treatment, you give both groups a pretest. That pretest measures them at the beginning of the study. And now, at the end of the study, you know how much they've changed. Hi, Kat. Are you excited about the pretest? But it's it's honestly his favorite research design. He does not like the next one, which is the Solomon Four Group design. Do you have anything else to say about? Great. Thank you so much. Uh, the uh, so you randomly set into two groups, right? Uh, you control the independent variable, one group gets it, one group does not, but before you give them the independent variable, you have this pretest. But you compare these scores at the end on the, po uh, the post test, uh, and that is why it's a pretest, post test design. I know what you're thinking. Please stop saying I know what you're thinking. I know what else you're thinking. Why don't we always just do the pretest post test design? That is a great question that you asked. Well, the reason for that is because sometimes tests are expensive, right? Let's just say you had 100 copies of this survey, right? Uh, and it cost you $100 to print all of them total. And that's for the post test design. If you decide to do pretest, post test, your cost doubles. Don't fade away, right? Uh, so now, in total, you're spending $200. That can get pretty pricey. If you're doing a test that involves something much more precise or invasive, the cost of doing your study is going to double. So it could go from 5,000 to 10,000, from 10,000 to 20,000. So if you don't need to do a pretest, by all means, don't do a pretest. But if it seems like you might need to do a pretest, 
that's why we have this pretest post-test design so that you can measure them at the beginning and see how much change happens from the beginning of the study to the end of the study. I know what you're not thinking, which is what happens if the pretest accidentally in some weird roundabout way introduces a third variable? Like, wouldn't that be crazy if somehow by introducing the pretest, I'm throwing off people's perceptions and I'm causing a change in the measurement of the post test? So, if I'm measuring something like stress or anxiety, what if having them say how stressed or anxious they are makes them more stressed or anxious? Meaning that when I get the post test, they're more stressed or anxious than they would have been already, right? Or what if uh, I give them a math test for the pretest, and that makes them better at the math test. I told you my cat does not like this research design. He's very, I know, but we have to talk about it. It's an important, it's an important measure. We have to talk about it. I'm so sorry. He's just very emotional. Uh, yeah, he took a research design class. It was just a traumatic experience for him. Uh, so sometimes what happens is the pretest, right? could be a third variable. Maybe it's a math test. Maybe you get better at math. You're like, oh, I remember how long division works, right? So this, the presence of the pretest could actually affect the scores on the post-test. So what we can do is what's called the Solomon four-group design, where we have uh, uh, two groups that get the pretest, two groups that don't get the pretest. We have two groups that get the treatment, and we have two groups that don't get the treatment, right? So we have one group, pretest and treatment, another group, pretest only, another group, treatment only, and another group, no treatment, no pretest. And all four groups get the post test. And this allows us to do some really cool things. One, we can see if the pretest is a potential third variable because if it's if the pretest doesn't make a difference, then regardless if you have the pretest or not, your scores should be the same. So we should be able to compare the treatment groups, the one that has a pretest and the one that doesn't have the pretest, and we should see that their scores are similar. I'm going to need you to just wait a second. I will give you food. I'm doing work right now. So we compare the pretest group and the no pretest group, both treatment groups, and we should get comparable scores. If the scores are different, right, if it's like 10 and 7, then we know that this pretest affected this score, right? Same thing with the no treatment group, the control group. If this is like 8 and 6, then we know that the pretest affected the post test. Then we look at just the treatment groups, and then we compare those to the uh, control groups, right? And then we look to see what the averages of these are and what the averages of these are, right? And then we can see whether or not the treatment groups are different than the control groups. So the Solomon four group design allows us to control for the pretest as a potential third variable. So we can look at three different things, right? We can compare both treatment groups to one another. We can compare both control groups to one another. And then we can compare all treatments versus all controls, like we would in a regular study. And if you notice, these top two are basically just a pretest post test design. These bottom two are a post test only design, right? So we're basically running both at the exact same time so we can control for the pretest potentially being a third variable. I know what you're I know I know what you're thinking. Why don't we just do this all the time? Same issue as the pretest post test. It's going to be more expensive. And because you're taking your sample and now dividing it into four groups, each group is going to have a smaller sample size. So if you had 20 people in your pretest post test design uh, in each group, now you only have 10 people in each group. 
So you'd actually have to double the number of people in your study to get the same number of people in each group, which means more of an expense. So these are the three basic experiments that I want you to be aware of. So I'm doing a little study to talk about how candy affects your stress level, right? And I could do post-test only. I could do pre-test, post-test. I could do the solvent for group design. All of them are going to start with random assignment into groups, right? Uh, post-test only and pre-test, post-test. I'm going to put them into two groups. Solvent for group. Guess how many groups? Four groups. Crazy, right? Uh, now, in my post-test only, what I do is I randomly assign into my treatment and control groups. There's no uh, pre-test. Uh, I give one group, the treatment group, the experimental group, right? I give them candy, and then after I give that group candy, I compare both groups, the candy and no candy group, on how much stress they have. And hopefully, I'll see that there's a significant difference between the two groups. Now, Cat, get out of here. I'll feed you in a second. He also gets very, just when I talk about candy, he's like, I want candy, and you can't eat candy. You're a cat. The pretest, post test design, it would be a similar thing, right? Randomly assigned to two groups. I give both groups a pretest, so I measure their stress at the beginning of the study. My treatment group, my experimental group, gets candy, and then both groups get a post-test. And I measure them on that post-test, uh, and I compare their scores, right? Random assignment gives me equivalent groups. Uh, I have control over the independent variable, and I'm measuring the dependent variable, the three things that I need for a basic experiment. Finally, if I were to do the uh, Solomon 4 group, I randomly assign two four groups. One group gets a pretest and candy. Another group gets a pretest with no candy. One group gets a pre uh, no pretest and candy. And another group gets no pretest and no candy, right? Uh, so now I'm controlling for that pretest as a potential third variable. Then I compare all of them on stress, and that is my study. I'm seeing all the comments that you're posting right now on my YouTube channel, and I'm hearing that you want more. You are unsatisfied with what I've taught you, which is fair. I hear your thirst for knowledge. I've also distracted my cat with wet food. So what we've been talking about are between group designs. Between group designs basically compare two different groups, right? Uh, I'm looking at differences between groups. And what that means is uh, if I have multiple levels of the independent variable, then everybody who's in a group only gets exposed to one, right? So in my candy study, you either got candy or you didn't get candy, right? Uh, or if I were uh, studying multiple types of candy, uh, Crunch Bar, Butterfinger, no candy, right? You'd either get a crunch bar, a butterfinger, or no candy. That is the between group design. And it's really great if you have lots of people that you can put in each group. Now, maybe you just have three people who are available. And you're like, well, I want to see what happens if I give them nothing, right? And then what happens if I give them a crunch bar? Does that affect their stress? And then what happens if I give them a Butterfinger, right? Because if I only have three people and I do a between group design, then I only have one person in each group. If everybody gets to be in each group, then I now have three people in each group, right? So sometimes you want to do a within group design and expose everybody in your sample to every level of the independent variable, right? Now, there are issues with this, and we're going to talk about that. But remember, between group, you're comparing, right? Uh, so think of the sentence, I'm looking at a difference between two groups, right? So with between group, if there are three different groups you can be in, you're only going to be in one group. Within group, 
everybody gets exposed to everything. They get to try the Butterfinger, the Crunch Bar, the Skittles, right? And they're just having no candy and looking on while other people are eating candy and they get to feel sad, right? That's the within group design. So you know me, I'm competitive, right? I got to have the edge on my other professors. So there are a few other professors who teach research methods just like me, but I need to know for sure that I'm the best. I know I'm the best, but I need to prove it because my self-esteem is very low. So there are three professors, right? Uh, we have Thompson, we have Levine, we have Seligman. Now there are two types of designs that we could do, right? We could do a between group designs where I randomly assign people into three classes and then see what their grades are at the end of the semester. Or as one of you uh, very smartly pointed out to me, uh, I could just have you guys switch teacher uh, teachers uh, at different points in the semester. So you take the first exam and then, uh, and all that entire time, you've been with me. Then uh, up till the second exam, you have Professor Levine. And then up till your final exam, you have Professor Seligman, right? So everybody does Thompson first, then Levine second, then Seligman third. That would be a, uh, a, a within groups design, right? Now, the issue with this is there are different aspects to the order of taking one professor to uh, after another that we have to take into account. If one professor is very terrible, right, and ruins uh, your like love of science, then it's going to affect how well you do in other classes. If one professor gives you really great study skills, it's going to make you do better as you go on. So there are some things that are referred to as order effects, and we'll talk about those next. So there are three order effects that I want us to be aware of. Uh, order effects are just basically when the order of the levels of a variable affect the results, right? So there could be a difference if uh, Professor Levine was a second professor you have. If you have me first versus having Professor Seligman first, that might affect your scores in Professor Levine's class. So one thing that we need to be aware of is what's called the practice effect, which is the improvement in performance over time. So something that could happen is uh, based off the fact that like the first time you're like, I have no idea what any of this is, right? Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm not doing as well in the first part of the semester, but by the end of the semester, I'm kicking butt. I'm doing great, right? Or the opposite could happen, the fatigue effect, where your performance deteriorates over time, right? Uh, at the beginning of the semester, you have all this energy. You're so motivated. By the second exam, oh, you just, you just want it to be over. And by the third exam, the final exam, right, you just see graduation and you just like, you're just pull, you're dragging yourself uh, to that stage because you're just so exhausted. So first test, you get an A. Second test, you get a low A. And then the third test, you get a B plus. Oh, I'm so disappointed, right? Uh, so the practice effect can see that scores are increasing over time, not because of the professor you have, but just because you are getting better at being in the class. Fatigue effect, same, right? Whoever is the last person might be a great teacher, but you guys might just be exhausted. And there's also the idea of the carryover effect, which is what I was mentioning earlier when I talked about study skills, right? If you uh, learn something really great, like 
uh, your first professor was like, the secret to uh, research methods is this rep that I'm going to teach you, right? And that rep makes the rest of the semester super easy for you, right? Then based off of the fact that you had that professor first, that's going to make your response to the other professors better. So, or maybe you just have a terrible professor who makes this class feel impossible, right? And they don't teach you the core things that you need to know in order to do well later, then you're going to be affected by that and you're not going to be able to do as well. So the second and third professors might be phenomenal, but your first professor, Professor Thompson, just really made it impossible for you to do well. Shame on you, Professor Thompson. So practice effect, scores increase over time. Uh, fatigue effect, uh, performance decreases over time. Carryover effect, uh, one level of the independent variable that happens before another affects your scores on that later one. So one thing that you can do is what is called counterbalancing. So if I have two different levels of the independent variable, I could do all of treatment A first and then all of treatment B second, or I can split them into two groups and one group gets treatment A first, the other group gets treatment B first, and then in the next uh, part of the trial, one group gets treatment B first or second, uh, and then the other group gets treatment A second, right? Uh, and what this does is it helps get rid of some of the order effects. So if there is an issue with uh, fatigue, right, everybody's feeling a little t more tired in the second part, but that's affecting B and A equally, right? If it's a practice effect, it's the same thing it's affecting B and A equally because half of the people are tired, but they're getting A and half of the people are tired and they're getting B. So any effect that it would have on that independent variable is uh, happening to both levels of the independent variable. So it evens that out. What it doesn't necessarily uh, fix is what's, uh, is a carryover effect, right? Because let's just say a has a very strong carryover effect, right? Here, it affects B. But right here, if A is the only one that has a carryover effect, then it doesn't affect anything there. So in addition to counterbalancing, sometimes we have to do what's called a Latin square. So if you've ever done a Sudoku puzzle, this will seem familiar to you. Uh, the idea is that uh, in all of these little columns, you don't see uh, the same letter twice, right? Uh, which means that uh, A is only the first treatment once, B is only the first treatment once, uh, uh, B is only the first treatment once, C is only the first treatment once, D is only the first treatment once. And it's also the second treatment once, the third treatment once, and the fourth treatment once, right? So it helps us get rid of the fatigue effect and the practice effect like we talked about. The other thing that's specific to the Latin square, which is a very specific form of counterbalancing, is the fact that it helps us get rid of the carryover effect. So remember, A has that very strong carryover effect. Maybe the other ones don't really have a carryover effect, but A really has a carryover effect, right? So before, uh, we had the issue of A just affecting B, but now A affects B just once, affects D just once, affects C just once, and uh, doesn't affect anything once. So whatever carryover effect it had on everything else is balanced out by the fact that everything has been affected by A. So in the Latin square, what I want you to know is it's just a much more efficient way of counterbalancing because it helps get rid of all of the order effects.
so to review when you're designing an experiment the important thing is control of that independent variable by controlling that independent variable it allows you to make it an experiment not just a study by making it an experiment you're able to determine causation one key term i want to remind you of is the confederate you might remember this from Milgram's experiment. You might see this photo and you might go, ah, that's Milgram's experiment, right? This is the learner being strapped up, but he's not actually about to get electrically shocked, as you should know by this point. He is pretending to be a participant, but he is actually a member of the research team. He's acting. It was all a ruse, right? Confederates are used in order to deceive a participant of the study. Because if you didn't think that you were actually shocking a human being, everyone would just go all the way to just see hear what the recording sounded like, right? But if you thought that you were hurting an actual person, then that's going to affect your decision making. So a confederate is one way of, uh, uh, is a really great method of deceit which you can use uh, appropriately in certain types of research designs. When it comes to measuring the dependent variable, there are a few things that you can do. You can do a self-report, uh, which is basically a survey. So you ask somebody to report something. It could be their GPA, it could be their age, it could be symptoms of depression, right? Uh, but the self-report is the asking somebody else to measure something for you. On a scale of 1 to 10, how stressed are you feeling today, right? That would be a self-report. We can also do behavioral measures, right? We're looking at them do a specific thing and see how long they can do it, how well they can do it, how long it takes them to react to something, right? Uh, so... If I wanted to see how uh, long somebody takes a sip from a water fountain, and if there's a difference in how long people drink from a water fountain based off of how anxious they feel, right? That would be a behavioral measure because I'm watching them do it, and then I'm, I have my like stopwatch and I'm taking the time. If I ask them, how long do you usually spend at a water fountain? That would be a self-report. I can also do a physiological measure. Now, most physiological measures are pretty invasive. These are getting readings from the body. It could be something as simple as blood pressure uh, or temperature, or it could be a brainwave pattern. So you could do an EEG, or you can look at heart rate. You can do brain scans with an MRI, right? These are physiological measures. Now, all of these have their issues, right? Self-reports, you're depending on the person to have accurate information. I tell you that my GPA is a 3.8. It's actually a 3.67. Oh, no, right? Uh, a behavioral measure also depends on the person who's rating the behavior. So you have to be very specific about how you want a behavior to be measured so it can be measured accurately. Physiological measures tend to be more expensive to measure uh, and they can be more invasive. So you can run into ethical issues, right? You can't just get three pints of blood from somebody for your study. I mean, no, no, no. You, you definitely shouldn't. Is that a lot of blood? I think that's a lot of blood. Yeah, let's just say no. Don't get three pints of blood from somebody. Yeah, I just Googled it. So the average human has 10 pints of blood in their body. Oh, that's a lot of blood. And uh, usually when you donate, you donate one pint. Three pints would be a lot of blood. So uh, definitely don't do that. Uh, so I uh, googled uh, uh, sensitivity for an image, and uh, this this woman just like staring out while somebody's holding her shoulders just like spoke to me. So uh, 
sensitivity is a specific aspect of a measurement tool. And it basically just refers to the fact that uh, a measurement tool should be able to get low scores and high scores, right? So if I have a ruler, but my ruler can only at minimum measure something that is seven inches, right? And I'm trying to measure this like little inchworm uh, because I'm in a biology class, right? Then everything is going to be at least seven inches because that's the lowest thing on that thing, right? Uh, so a good real ruler should be able to do like one inch, half an inch, an eighth an inch of an inch, a sixteenth of an inch, right? Uh, it should also be able to measure longer things, right? If I have a yardstick, it can go to three feet. Uh, I think that's how many feet are in a yard. That's how the imperial system works, right? So uh, sensitivity refers to a test ability to measure high and low scores. Imagine if you took the exam, right? You have an exam coming up, and on this exam, the highest score is a 37%. Low score is a zero. The highest score is a 37%. That is not a sensitive test. That is a poorly designed test. Equally poorly designed, although this, <laughs> you might disagree with me, would be a test where the lowest score is a 96%, right? The people who study really hard and watch the lecture 26 times, right, they get uh, at 98%. The people who like were like, uh, I don't really care. Let's just see how I do. They get a 96%. That test is insensitive because it cannot accurately discern between people who did very well and people who did very poorly. On a well-designed test, now I don't want anyone to fail, but if you haven't been in class and you haven't been paying attention, you should fail. If you study hard and you pay attention, you should do well right? That's how a well-designed test should work. It should be able to measure high and low scores. So a test where all the scores are too high, right, that is referred to as the ceiling effect. You can think of it because all the scores are at the ceiling. I am currently pointing to my ceiling, realizing that you cannot see me pointing to my ceiling. I hope that you could feel that I was pointing to my ceiling then. Now, uh, the floor effect is the opposite. All the scores are too low. Right now, I'm motioning very aggressively at the floor, right? Uh, so that is a test where everybody, uh, everybody fails, right? Uh, so uh, if you're looking at like an STD test, right? Uh, a, if everybody uh, has chlamydia according to this test, right? Uh, even people who have never had any sort of sexual experience and been exposed to anyone who uh, would uh, have the disease, everybody has chlamydia, right? Ceiling effect. Not everyone should have chlamydia, especially if you don't have chlamydia. That's also what's called a false positive, right? Uh, if everybody uh, takes a test and like people who like very much have the chlamydia, right? You like look at them, you're like, oh, that person has the chlamydia. You know, when you look at somebody and you're like, that person has chlamydia, right? That person takes a test and the test says they don't have chlamydia. That's a false negative. Also, it is a floor effect because everybody uh, shouldn't uh, be negative or positive. When all the scores are too high, that is the ceiling effect. When all the scores are too low, that is the floor effect. So you might have heard that the, uh, of like mind over matter, right? The power of the mind. And some of that idea is a little bunk, sciencey, pseudoscientific, but there is some truth to it. There's the idea that based off of what we believe is going to happen, that can actually happen. So let's say I think that there's something in my food that I'm allergic to, will I have an allergic reaction? Now, you might say, it depends on whether or not there's something uh, that would trigger allergy in your food. 
And to that I respond, yes, but maybe. My perception that I might have an allergic reaction actually makes me more likely to have an allergic reaction. If I have been feeling ill and I take a pill, that actually doesn't make me feel better, but I believe that it's going to make me feel better, then I will feel better. This is what we're talking about when we're talking about the placebo effect and the nocebo effect. The placebo effect is when we assume that something good is going to happen, right? And that actually happens. The nocebo effect is when we assume something terrible is going to happen and it actually happens. Some, uh, the classic example of the nocebo effect is like a real hilarious trope in movies uh, where uh, a kid's at like a party. It's like their first high school party uh, and they've had like three beers and they're drunk and they're wild. And then uh, they're like about to do something super embarrassing. And then uh, they're like, I can't help it. I'm drunk. And then somebody's like, you've been drinking O'Doul's uh, uh, all night, right? Uh, and they're like, ooh, ooh, what, right? Uh, so they were drinking something that had no alcohol, but they got super wasted. Why? Because they thought that they were going to get wasted, so they felt that effect in their body, right? So uh, I know what you're thinking. I don't know what you're thinking, but I'm just going to keep on saying that because that's my thing now, right? Does that mean that if I get drunk, I might be more drunk than I actually am just because I think I'm going to get drunk. Yes, right. Uh, and once you go down that rabbit hole, it gets real weird. Now, the placebo effect is when we assume a positive benefit, right? So this is the issue with things like dietary supplements, uh, you know, like uh, uh, different, uh, what are they, multivitamins, uh, different types of cleanses. If you 100% believe that something is going to make you feel better, it's going to make you feel better, more than likely, because of the placebo effect. Now, this is where science and, like, folk, uh, like, anecdotal evidence start to conflict. Because I go, well, I was feeling sick. I took this once a day for three months, and since then, I've been feeling significantly better. And then I, the scientist, go, great, I'm glad you feel better. That does not mean that it made you feel better. And then the, you're thinking, well, like, these two things are related, so obviously if I took the thing, it made me feel better. But this is the core of scientific understanding. Yes, it's related to you feeling better, but it didn't necessarily cause you to feel better. Now, this is the thing. It could have caused you to feel better, but we can't definitively say that, right? So we could only definitively say that when we do an experiment. So we, uh, we go, great, wonderful. Uh, we're going to take 30 people and we're going to... Uh, 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 give 15 of them the pill, 15 of them we don't give a pill, right? Or we can give them a sugar pill and tell them that they're getting the pill. That's why we have what are called placebo pills that's uh, related to the placebo effect. So if people who get the sugar pill and people who get the actual pill, if they report the same increase in well-being, both of them feel significantly better, then it's not the actual pill, it's the placebo effect. Now, if the people who take the sugar pill don't feel better, and the people who take the actual supplement feel significantly better, and there's a significant difference between these two groups, then we can definitively say, or at least with more certainty, because we're just rejecting the null hypothesis, that it's very likely that this pill is effective. And this difference between uh, doing a true experiment and just relying on anecdotal evidence is so important to science, but we love 
uh, as human beings to rely on anecdotal evidence. Uh, and we say, well, it worked for my friend, so it's going to work for me, right? But we never take into account the possibility that the only reason it worked for our friend is because they believed it was going to work. And that's why uh, if you if you take nothing else from this class, uh, and I know I probably said this before in a lecture, but if you only take five things from this class, this would be the thing that I think is most important. This understanding that just because something happens doesn't mean that one thing caused the other. So just because it worked for somebody else doesn't mean that it's 100% true, right? Uh, we don't just give feathers to elephants because we saw that one feather given to one elephant makes all, like, made that elephant fly. So now we can make all elephants fly. If you haven't seen Dumbo, by the way, what are you doing? Go take a break from this video, go on the Disney Plus, watch the old animated version, realize that it's very dated and a little racist sometimes. And I say a little racist, and by that I mean a lot of racist sometimes. So watch it, feel really bad, but also go, eh, at least America's gotten a little bit better, kind of, and then come back and watch the rest of this lecture. I know what you, nah, I'm, I'm not going to do it this time. So if you're wondering, uh, I'm basically doing it, it's fine. I know what you're thinking. Uh, how do we prevent the placebo effect? Well, one thing uh, that I mentioned was the placebo pill, right? Because if I give one group a pill and one group not a pill, right, they're going to feel like uh, they're going to know, like, if I don't take a pill, I'm not going to have the placebo effect. So there are certain things that you can do to, uh, so if it's a drug, right, you just give a placebo pill, which is just a pill that uh, is like either a sugar pill, or maybe you just give them like an Advil, right? Something like that, that makes them think that they're uh, drinking the actual thing, right? You can, um, if you're doing a study with like alcohol, sometimes uh, you'll just give people tonic water and they'll think that they're drinking alcohol. If you're, uh, there are studies on the effects of certain surgeries and they'll give what's called a sham surgery. So you'll go under, you'll get an incision, right? They'll do a little cut. So you'll see that you've been cut open. You'll remember going under, but they don't cut anything out. And what this allows us to do is feel like the thing has happened. So there's no uh, room for, uh, oh, well, I didn't get an actual surgery. So obviously, like, the, the groups just wouldn't be comparable, right? So that type of study where you uh, allow the participants to uh, uh, really believe that they could be in either the treatment or control group is called a single blind study. So the participants don't know if they got a real surgery or fake surgery. They don't know if they got a glass with alcohol or glass with no alcohol. They don't know if the pill that they took is an actual pill or not, right? Now, sometimes what can happen is the researchers based off of just unconscious bias, uh, sometimes intentionally, sometimes uh, 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 unintentionally, they might, uh, they might somehow subtly affect the participants. So let's say I was going to give a speech to two different rooms for two different uh, groups. One is a control group, one is a treatment group. And I say, hey guys, just so you know, uh, there could be some side effects of the, uh, you know, pills or whatever. So, like, if anything happens, feel free to reach out to us. Numbers on the paper. Uh, yep, um, have a, thanks for participating, right? That's the speech to one group. And the speech to the other group is, so just so you know, this is an experimental drug. And uh, with any drug trial, there are a whole bunch of risk. And even though we have done uh, lots of uh, testing on animals, this is our first human trial. So uh, we have some idea of some of the possible side effects. But I want you guys to know if anything, if anything feels uh, odd or uncomfortable, report to us at once. We really care for you and we want to make sure that you're safe. And if there's ever an emergency situation uh, where your life is in danger, 
call 911. Please call 911. Our phone numbers are uh, on the uh, contact sheet. Make sure uh, you keep that with you uh, so that you can always reach out to us. Feel free to put my number right. You see that there's a slight difference in how I've communicated. Uh, if you get that later speech, you for sure are going to have a little bit of placebo or nocebo effect, right? Uh, if you get the previous speech, you're going to be like, oh, this isn't a big deal at all, right? You'll take your pills and call it a day. So in a double-blind study, what happens is the, neither the participants or the uh, researchers know who's in the control group or the treatment group. So I have to give the same speech to both groups because I don't know who's which group is actually in danger and actually not in danger. If you're wondering about the logistics of that, uh, what ends up happening is different people will be in charge of communicating different bits of information. So let's say uh, I'm, uh, I'm the person who's walking into the room. Uh, the person who has assigned people into groups is not going to be me, right? Because I might be able to figure it out. The person who assigned people into groups is going to be someone else. And then the person who's running the statistics isn't going to know which group is group a and which group is group B, they're going to be labeled something like group red and group 17, right? Uh, so that they have no idea which group is which and they can't subtly bias uh, the information when they're doing the statistics. So in a double blind study, nobody knows uh, except for a select few people who are on the research team for practical purposes, uh, but that reduces bias from both the participants and the researchers. Great, we did it. Hope you're doing well. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Uh, slam some questions in that comment section below. Don't forget to uh, like and subscribe if you wanna hear more lectures like this. Uh, hit that bell icon so when I'm recording these at 2 a.m. and I post them, uh, you can be the first to listen to these sweet lectures. My cat is full. I am tired. This is Professor Thompson signing off.